Hello there, my name is Leonard Paul, and uh, I work at the School of Video Game Audio, so SOVGA.com, and I'm also the composer for the Beat Movie documentary. So that you can find at BeatMovie.com, and uh, that's put together by Karen Collins and a whole bunch of talented folks, and it's a documentary video on the history of video game audio and the people that made it. So definitely recommend to check out the webisodes. There's also a book happening and all sorts of other great stuff. So make sure to check out BeatMovie.com and have a look at the details. Um, With this video, what I wanted to do is show you in detail how um, I put together this patch for the Beep logo audio. Uh, Karen Collins came up with the original sound design and then what I did is I reverse engineered it by listening to it, also doing some spectral analysis to figure out how um, she used this uh, online web program that makes uh, 8-bit audio sounds and then I reverse engineered you know, using Pure Data. So Pure Data is a visual scripting language started in around, you know, 95 or so. Some of you might also know of uh, Max MSP. That's kind of like the commercial cousin of PD. I tend to use Pure Data when teaching because uh, it's free and it's open source. So if you want to change anything with it, you can. Uh, it runs on basically everything. So you can download versions for Mac, PC, Linux, or whatever. And uh, to get PD, you go to puredata.info. So um, that's a great way of either picking up PD Extended, which I'm running here just because it looks a little bit prettier, or you can use PD Vanilla. If you use um, sort of PD Vanilla is kind of like the main branch, so or it's sort of I guess you'd say more so the trunk of the tree. And then like uh, that's Miller Puckett, who's the originator of it. And then all these other great people from the open source community have added visual stuff. Um, such as video and other things to uh, PD. So um, if you use PD Vanilla with this, then you just won't get the video, but everything else will work. All the audio stuff will work. So as far as how this patch uh, functions, if you haven't used PD before, um, yeah, download uh, PD for your system first, and then download the patch um, from sovga.com slash beep logo audio.pd and then that will download um, the actual patch so and the interesting thing is that it's all just text Um, but of course when you open it up in PD it will look a lot nicer and it'll look like this okay so I made it you know sort of a little bit of like the rainbow and then there's like some you know great anyways you, you know it looks a lot nicer than the, just using text so I have programmed in C C++ and a whole bunch of other languages but I kind of like using PD because it's visual it's immediate and it's just I find it fun to play around with so what you need to do to get this patch to work first download PD and then download the patch from here and then you should be able to open PD and then open the patch from within PD and then you'll get this, uh, you know, sort of appear for you if all goes well. If it doesn't go well, or if you have uh, questions about Pure Data, just contact me, Leonard Paul. I put the J in there because, you know, it just makes it easier to Google me. And then um, if you go to sovga.com, there's an email. Uh, if you just send an email to the School of Video Game Audio, so game audio school at gmail.com then you'll get to me all right so hopefully you're able to get to this point where this thing is all ready to go and make some sound so if we play it very cute so and then if we want video to display while we're playing it whoopsies Uh, Let's go like that. Play. Right? So there you can see how it syncs up with the visuals for introducing the beat movie. All right. 
as far as the way that this patch works overall, the information kind of starts at the top where you click on this thing, and it's kind of like an instantaneous switch. This is called a bang, and then it bangs out here, and then uh, the information starts to go out here to the video to say start the video, and then also send a vi an information little bang here to uh, this the guy, which uh, says start this so like write the audio information out to an array which allows us to save it which is helpful because then you can actually use it in the movie right needs a wave file okay and then after that it hits this bang which says do it and it just spits it out to all of these here and they all have a different delay time on them which means that uh, this delay is in milliseconds so on the far left here, this is 200 milliseconds, so that's, you know, a fifth of a second. And then this guy here, because it's one, two, three, if you get rid of the back three, move the decimal place over, that is exactly one second in. And it proceeds from there, and then eventually gets up to about, you know, six seconds in or so. All right. So if we look at the details of this, uh, the information would go down here, and then it would be delayed the least amount of time here, and then set a bang here, and then go into this here. What I've done is I've done a, uh, I've made a little patch that uh, hides most of the information, but it shows the, uh, what's uh, like a table output here of like an oscilloscope. So if I hit this, you know, this guy here, and the output are the same because the audio coming out of these uh, units here are all summed together into here and then there's a chunk that gets written out to the um, oscilloscope basically like the uh, the levels that you are like the samples that you're outputting to the DAC so digital audio converter here okay and then we also write this into our array here so that we can, like, if I play around to this, bleh, you know, and then I hit play, it'll rewrite all that stuff with the correct information. See? And then it's all regenerated again. Everything here is synthesized. There's no samples. You can definitely use samples in pure, pure data, but what I wanted to do with this patch is to like specifically show how older video game systems like you know the old arcade machines uh, before uh, sampling or like the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System or the Commodore 64 in general I mean both of those systems you could still do sampling with them but they were primarily uh, synthesis and the reason for that is that uh, both processors and memory were really expensive so to be able to play back a sample would take up a ton of memory. So the Commodore 64 only had 64 kilobytes of memory. So if you're going to play back, you know, like a sound like this, that's even like six seconds long, you're definitely going to blow the memory. It's going to be like way too big. So you have to figure out um, mathematical ways of generating the audio, and that's synthesis. So to get back to the patch, um, this first element here is called a noise hit. Right, and it sounds kind of gritty. Well, why does it sound gritty? Okay, if we look in here, um, there is the um, the table output that allows us to see what's going on with this. So, you know, and there's a better sort of representation down here, just because it's bigger. So the information from the bang goes out here first. It goes the outputs go from right to left. That's just the convention. So it goes down here, and then it hits this thing here, which is a message. And you can tell because it's got a scoop out of the right-hand side. And um, this message, uh, like every message in pure data, it really depends on what object you're sending it to. This here is an object with three inputs. We're only using the first one here. And the first one is the input that says do something. So we're going to get this message and it's going to say do something. The way that this message is formatted is that it's all, it's basically got two messages in it. First, it sends out this message, which is one and zero. The V-line object understands to say like, oh, I need to make the audio level that I'm going to output here. That's why there's this fat audio cable. Whereas this one here is a thin audio, or sorry, a thin connection, which is a control rate message. 
it's going to take this message here, which is um, basically sort of describing how the audio should work, and then it's going to change it into audio. So it says, okay, jump the audio level up to one, which is full scale. The audio goes um, from one down to negative one at the bottom. So start at one uh, and change the level instantaneously, like you, over zero milliseconds. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to ramp down to zero. So we're going to ramp down from zero over 800 milliseconds. Okay. And we're going to do that using a V-line object. So if we want, well, let's see how that looks. Okay. I can actually just reroute the audio into here. And then if I click on this, you can see that, you know, it goes from one, which is at the top, down to zero. Okay. And then it puts this into this object here, which looks a little bit weird. So this asterisk or star means to multiply the signal, the audio signal, by the amount of uh, audio that's coming in here. Okay, so if we multiply this signal by one, that means that we're not changing the signal at all, which means that this is basically sending an envelope. So it's, it's sort of like you've got your hand on the volume dial and then you're turning it from full volume, which is one, and then over you know almost a second or 800 milliseconds, you turn it down to zero. That's what this whole thing here is doing. All right. And at that point, the sort of the PD knows that like, oh, okay, there's nothing else to do here. So then it goes back up to the trigger and then it looks at this. It's like, oh, okay, the bang travels down here and it hits this message box. And with this, we're going to do, you know, the messages are formatted the same. So we're going to jump up to 300 over 0 milliseconds and then uh, basically ramp down to 200 over 800 milliseconds. So what does that sound like? Um, well, let's just do this so that we have both together. So you can see sampling rate ramps down from 300 to 200, right? So it gives that sort of like kind of feel to it because what's happening is that we're changing the uh, frequency using the V-line here for into the phaser. So a phaser here, if we look at this, the phaser, okay, it's just a sawtooth wave, okay? And right now, uh, if I change the value here, just so that we could see a little bit better, um, of course, because we've still got an input. Okay, so there it is. But anyways, I just wanted to demonstrate that that's what that is. It's a phaser, and it's modulating the frequency of the phaser. Okay, so it goes into there. Phaser is just a sawtooth wave. It's pretty boring. It goes from zero, ramps up to one, and then it goes down again. So if you had phaser of, you know, like frequency one, then it would go from zero to one continuously. Uh, you know, every second. So go from zero up to one and then jump down to zero and then up to one and it would take a second long, uh, you know, amount of time to do that each time. Okay. And then we're going to input this into the sample hold, which really just grabs a sample from the left inlet. Uh, every time that drop happens. So when it drops down from one down to zero, okay that's when it's going to grab the information from the noise that's being continuously generated here. So one of the nice things about PD is that you can right click on an object and go help. Help. <laughs> okay. And then from there it describes the whole thing. All right. Isn't that nice? So it says a sample and hold unit. So it says incoming signal, which is sampled whenever the right input decreases in value, such as phaser does each period. Okay. Once again, if you have the uh, frequency set to one, then that period is also one. Okay. So let's, let's have a look at that. So if I take the noise here, I can actually get all the way around this stuff and just spit it out. Oh, lovely white noise. Okay, but uh, those old video game systems, they couldn't spit out a lot of numbers very quickly. So um, really what happened is that instead of being able to generate random numbers that fast, it would only be able to do it maybe like 200 times a second. 
but with those systems you could also modulate that a little bit too to get different sort of flavors of noise so if I take the sampling hold here see how that works so what it's doing is it's taking the noise and then it's uh, just grabbing it 200 times a second and then it holds that sample value that's why you see all those flat you know like areas in there it makes it sort of sound like all grumbly and stuff um, if I wanted to let's just experiment here a little bit so I'm gonna take a signal here and I think it was at 200 okay so that's just saying like set the um, oopsies I actually want to do it up here sorry about that oh, come here okay this guy here and uh, I do this a lot when I'm working on patches I just sort of play around so I'm gonna jam this phaser at 200 or we can just simply it's easier just to do it that way all right take this guy and go like that there's 200 but then if we start at 300 it sounds like this all right and then if we modulate between those two right that's what that sounds like okay so now to put everything together we have our envelope here that goes from one to zero so it basically just does a ramp down and it ends the sound within a second so over 800 milliseconds and then we've got this guy here that uh, takes the noise and then just sort of basically does a, like a, it changes it to a low sampling rate but modulates that sampling rate to give it sort of like a feeling like the pitch is being bent down boom right so yeah that's how that all works let's connect that up again for completeness all right great okay this one here I'm going to go a little bit faster now. Um, oh, and also I'll describe how this works here. So how does this guy here like actually graph into A2? So what it's doing is it's taking OSC or oscillator. Um, it's taking like a, a sine tone that in this case is at uh, 15 hertz, so 15 times a second. And then it uses the threshold function to see any time that signal passes zero, okay, when it goes down to zero, uh, through the zero, sorry, and then it basically graphs that, okay, um, because it's sending, it's translating this audio signal into a bang, that's what it's outputting there, it's hard to see, but that's, that's actually, you know, this one here is all fat, right? Whereas this one here is a control rate signal. It's sort of like if you ever work with um, modular synthesizers, it's kind of the difference between like audio rate, um, sort of like the output that you'll actually want to hear is the audio stuff. But then there's like CV or control voltages. And that's kind of like what the thin one is here. Okay, so another way of thinking of it is just that the audio stuff is usually things you want to hear uh, and then the control rate is usually stuff where you're telling it to do something mathematically. That's how it kind of works in general. All right, so that just means that this one here is being graphed 15 times a second. If I wanted to up that, I could, but 15 times a second is probably pretty good because if you raise it any higher, then it tends to just you know increase processing because it's happening across all of these different uh, you know like uh, units here. With this one here, we've got a noise wobble, so, you know, it's a similar length of time, a little bit shorter in this case, so this time we're only going half a second, and now what we're doing is taking the sine wave, so if I show you what that looks like, see, it goes up and down, if I slowed it down a little bit, I could maybe, yeah, sort of, yeah, that's better, because I'm sort of making it the same uh, frequency is this the rate that I'm scanning it at okay so it's basically you can see that it's like a sine wave um, maybe if I go like that then you can see it a little bit better yeah you know you get the idea right okay so with this this one is normally at six okay and then what happens is that I multiply it by 100 so that means make it big. So whoa, you know that that's graphing way off the top and way off the bottom because this this only goes from zero up to one and then down to negative one at the bottom. So 
I'm taking that number that starts out from 1 to negative 1, you know, from the oscillator here, and then I'm multiplying it to make it go from positive 100 to negative 100, okay? And then I'm going to add 2,000 to that, which makes it so that the range goes between uh, 1,900 to 2,200 hertz. And then I'm putting that into a phaser, which is the same as before, okay? And that is doing the sample and hold. So really what's that, what that is doing is it's kind of like jiggling the, um, the sampling rate on the noise, okay? So let's see if we can see what that looks like. I mean, <laughs> it's happening quite quickly, so it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But when you listen to it, it sort of sounds like the noise is being jiggled. So like shake, shaking around, right? Okay, so that's why that's called noise wobble. All right, next one here is a little bit easier. This one is noise low. This one here, I'm just setting the uh, noise uh, sampling rate to 760, okay? It's pretty basic. And then the next one, this one sounds a little higher. So with this one, instead of 760, it's being set to 900. So it sounds like the pitch is up. Okay. All right. This one's fun. So let's open up this, this patch here. All right. What this is doing is that I am getting um, do, 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 like the, the notes here. So this, this one here, the inlet is actually over here. It's a little bit confusing. So anyways, if I want it to trigger, then I would click here. Okay, so how does it get the notes? Well, the notes, uh, it says like here, this is in a sub patch called add notes. And the way that I got this is that I did the theme uh, a while back in FL Studio. I converted it to MIDI and then I converted the MIDI to text using an online free program. And I, I used that same program when I was working at a company called Modern Groove. Uh, and um, then I imported that text into uh, a spreadsheet, just, you know, like uh, put commas and stuff in there. And then from there, I just uh, basically played around with it a bit until it fit the format that I needed for pure data for this queue list. So what happens here is that these are all separate uh, messages. And what I'm doing is I'm adding a note. And this is the time offset or delay from the previous um, one. So here it's zero. And then I'm sending a message note. So that's why this one here says receive note. Okay, so it receives that and then it has three parameters after it. I don't use the last parameter. I just ignore the channel, but the other two are important. So that's the note. And then that there is the... Um, that's the velocity. Okay, so that's how loud it is. In this case, because it's supposed to be kind of computery, either I've basically just got the note on and off, and there's, you know, things are very metric. So it's either 100 for the note being on or uh, zero for turning the note off. All right. Okay, and that uh, sort of <laughs> like translating from, you know, your DAW, so be it like Cubase or Nuendo or I don't know, um, you know, like in my case, I was using FL Studio and translating into a spreadsheet is actually very common for working, you know, back in the day. But it's also fairly common if you're working with a very small sort of limited system like uh, mobile. OK, so that still gets used a lot in practice these days. And then I also set the tempo, not a big deal, but the cue list is really the object that's doing all the tricky stuff. So it's just firing out notes that, um, in this case, you know, this one here, uh, it fires note out right at the beginning and then it waits a little bit, sort of, you know, like these are in milliseconds. So that's a delay value from the previous message. So it waits about, you know, it waits 240 milliseconds before spitting out another note, which turns that note off. And then like, you know, um, 480 milliseconds after this guy, then I set another note on and then I turn it off and then I turn it on. But this one here, it's a different note now instead of it being do, 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 right? So if we listen to that, 
it, so and you can see the notes there. And you can also see the notes here, too. Okay? That's the pitch. Okay? And um, to be able to sort of see that pitch, I use this function here, which just says, like, okay, Moses, it splits the number stream. So if it's above one, then it goes out here. And if it's below one, then it goes here. So if it's above one, see, it turns it on. And then if it's a note off, then it turns off the... Um, the little slider knob or whatever there, okay? And um, so as far as tracing what happens here, first thing we do is we got a bang, goes into the cue list and says to play through there, okay? And then the cue list sends out all this note data, like literally it sends out notes, messages, and then I get three numbers associated with the note message. I throw away, you know, the last one, which is the channel. Then I use the um, velocity information to know if it's an on or off. I'm also outputting here out the outlet. Just um, let me see what that one's getting used for. Oh, that one's going to be used for the compressor. Basically, instead of using an audio message, I can actually uh, go a little bit better and then I know when the note is being played, so it doesn't really matter what the content of the note is. The uh, fact that a note is playing actually pushes down the sound design on the other two sounds that follow it. All right, and then what else do I do? I also um, take the velocity here, which is you know at most 100, so I divide it by 100. It could go up to 127, but in my case here, I want it to go to full scale. So I, I divide that by 100, which means that one, oh, here's a variable. So dollar sign one, it just means take the number that's coming in. If there's a list, then there might be more than one, but in this case, there's just one. Um, and here we put the number one in there. So with V line, what does that become? Well, that message becomes one. Uh, 10. So it says, okay, scale up to 1 over 10 milliseconds from whatever audio level you're currently at. And then if we get 0 through here, then 0 would get replaced here. And so that just basically allows me to envelope the information that's on this side. Okay, so that finishes that one. And then finally, we have our note data. So the note data, the MIDI data, goes between 0 and 127. And uh, in my case here, I've really got notes that go up to about 48 or something like that. So then here, I'm translating that um, from a MIDI value to a frequency value. If we wanted to, we could see what that is just by putting a little thing there and scrolling up and down. So 45 equals um, 110 hertz. Okay, and then it gets higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. Okay, all right, so that's how that works there. And then I input that into the oscillator, which is the sine wave. I multiply it by a whole bunch, so I make it go way out of the limits, but then I clip it to produce a square wave um, so that we actually get a square wave out of that. All right, so if we listen to it, we're enveloping here, we're getting a square wave here, and then we are going to... have a little riff that plays. Okay, so that's how that works. Uh, then it just gets easier again. So let's have a look here. This one here. Okay, so with this one, I'll just shortcut this a little bit. I've got an oscillator that I'm making a square wave out of. And then I'm just modulating the frequency so that it uh, goes between 520 and 720. So it gives a little shaky sound over you know, like a half second. Oh no, a quarter of a second. That's what that means there. Okay. And then, so that's the low. Uh, so remember that was 520. And then if I look at this one, you know, it goes uh, 650. So it's higher. Okay. Easy enough. This one here, uh, I've got two. I'm going to take them apart so that we can hear them separately. So you can hear that that one actually sounds kind of different than everything else? Well, the reason being is because I'm using a low-pass filter. 
With the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System, there was no filters that were possible, but on the Commodore 64, it had a great filter. It had an analog-based filter that uh, had resonance, and you could use it sort of selectively or on all or a combination of the three different voices. So this is sort of like the Commodore 64 kind of style. Uh, and let's see what happens here. So this one looks a little bit different. If I click on this, you know, what happens? Well, I'm using, in this case, I didn't use a line, a V line, I used a line object. They're basically the same. You know, I could actually change this uh, like this and get it so that it, it sounds the same, right? So what does that do? It ramps uh, from one down to zero over a quarter second. So that just makes it, you know, envelope it. And uh, to do the information goes down here. Uh, this is how I figure out how to set the, um, so we've got a, a filtered sawtooth LFO. So um, I don't actually, yeah, this resets the phase. So it means start from zero and then ramp up to one. And then it'll do this, uh, the frequency on that is uh, four times a second. So this one, I could have actually just done a, a you know, like a V line for this, but I guess if I made it longer, then I at least have it so that it repeats. So it should sound like, see? So it actually repeats if I continue the envelope. But it happens to be, a, you know, like this is happening four times a second, this happens one fourth of a second. So you just hear the ramp up from zero to one. And then I'm changing uh, note value 100. So I'm doing uh, MIDI to uh, frequency value. And I'm multiplying these two together. So that just means that I am ramping up to really quickly, actually. And we can look at that. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Well, this, guy, this one here will ramp up quite quickly. Anyways, what happens is that it ramps up the frequency from zero up to 100 as far as the frequency, and then it puts that into the low pass filter. So, okay, so this is, a, yeah, it's a sawtooth wave that is going from uh, frequency zero all the way up to uh, MIDI note 100 in frequency, and then it's being filtered, but then I'm also adding the frequency of 56 here to this and then sticking it into a sine wave okay so that means that I've got this is kind of like my um, you know base frequency of 56 but then I'm adding a little bit amount of that boring so that it gives a uh, yeah like a a <laughs> this this phaser is being dampened by the low pass filter so that it doesn't change uh, too quickly. So I guess kind of a cute sound there. All right. So yeah, that's what's going on there. Okay. So to recap, what's happening is that we've got our envelope here. Then this middle part here, I've got a ramp that's going up from zero to one, and then I am also multiplying it uh, from zero to uh, 100, uh, the note number 100, but then I'm putting a low pass filter on that so that it basically rounds off the edges so that it doesn't you know, happen instantaneously. If I changed this low pass and put it up higher, okay, You hear that click at the beginning? Well, if I put this here, yeah, it kind of rounds it off a little bit at the beginning. And then what I'm doing is I'm sending a MIDI note value of 56 down here and putting it into a sine wave, okay? And then obviously enveloping that. So that's how that guy's working. Okay, so that's the boop. And then the last one here is pretty simple. It's a coin hit. So with this one, you know, it's very cute. It sounds very Nintendo-ish. 
right? And so with this, I am enveloping over a quarter of a second. And the first thing that happens is that I set the MIDI note value of an oscillator that I'm going to clip to be a square wave. And then I delay, um, you know, a tenth of a second, and then I bump it up an octave to 98. So, okay. All right. That's what's going on there. If I had this um, enveloped, so if I set this like that. Yeah, that's a gorgeous sound. <laughs> okay, it's good to have it enveloped, all right? Yeah, so that it goes down in volume over a quarter of a second. So there we go, that's basically the whole patch. Um, uh, with this, there's a little bit of uh, a um, where I'm saying that I want to lower the volume of these two just so that it doesn't clip too much when those notes are playing. So it's uh, I'm actually taking the um, you know the fact that if a note is playing, lower the volume, and I'm using this expression here to do that mathematically. So I'm scaling those two based on if this guy is playing a note. Um, these two here, they get triggered and play at the same time, all right? So then they sound like, right, when they get played together. Um, and then because they're getting played together, I want to actually scale back the volume by half so that it doesn't end up being, you know, like, too too loud. Because if I didn't, it would, you know, basically go twice as loud. All the information goes into here, and then I'm outputting out my output array, and I'm also outputting to a save array, and if I wanted to, I could save that file out. So, once again, if you're interested in this patch, download it from here, uh, sovga.com slash beeplogoaudio.pd, and make sure, you know, obviously you need to have pure data downloaded. Uh, I think I've got version point uh, four, six or better should work just fine. And also, of course, make sure to check out uh, beatmovie.com, you know, for the history and all the cool stuff and people behind uh, the history of video game audio. Thanks again. My name is Leonard Paul from the School of Video Game Audio.